Hello and welcome to topic 3 of MATE 310 and 350 on polymer yielding. In this part of the lecture we'll be talking about the yielding of polymers or plastic deformation from a mechanics point of view. Let's get started. First of all we have to look at the stress strain curve for polymers. Now this is the stress strain curve for a typical thermoelastic polymer. If it were a thermo thermoplastic polymer, excuse me. If it were a thermoset polymer we'd have a very different looking curve. Nonetheless, we see here an initial region of linear elastic behavior, followed by a region of plastic deformation, then a maxima occurs, and the stress drops down. Now keep in mind, this is engineering stress and engineering strain, so our assumption here is that the cross-sectional area is being held constant. That's not quite correct. And at this maxima point, we actually have a place where the necking begins, and so the cross-section area is changing dramatically. Then we see a region of perfect plasticity where you get plastic strain without any increase in stress. And then finally the material work hardens considerably and you get failure at a very high stress relative to the other stress levels. Now if we plot it on top of this the true strain which takes into account the fact that the cross-sectional area is reducing, we see that we get a much more natural looking curve. That the stress continually increases on the material as we strain it. And just keep in mind that this the difference between these two curves is due to the fact that in engineering strain we're assuming a constant cross-section area, whereas in true strain we're taking into account the fact that the area is changing as we pull on, uh, pull on the material. So let's look more closely at the engineering stress and strain curve. The first property we come across is what's called the proportional limit. And this is the stress at which the material goes from being linear elastic to plastic or nonlinear. Then we have the yield point. Now, polymers are viscoelastic materials, which means that when I apply a strain, they'll continue to strain over time. Their strain is time dependent, unlike metals, which when you apply a stress, you get a fixed strain without any time dependent strain added on. So because of this viscoelastic effect, we cannot use the 0.2% offset method that we commonly use with metals. Instead, we define the yield point as the peak of this maxima where necking occurs in the material. We could also define the yield strain as the strain at which that same peak occurs. Following that peak, there's a region of thermal softening. Now, thermal softening occurs because as the material is being worked or stretched, there is heat generated, and that heat is released and softens the polymer chains and allows them to slide past one another more easily. And the reason this occurs is because the polymer is not very conductive, and so it can't dissipate the heat rapidly like a metal could. We then see a region of chain alignment over here, so we have the perfect plastic area, and then as the chains begin to align, the material applies more load to the covalent bonds between the carbon atoms along the chain backbone, and we see a dramatic increase in the stress required to cause failure. So as I mentioned before, this is a typical curve for a thermoplastic polymer. And as you'll note, we define the yield point as the peak of the curve, and the yield elongation as the strain that occurs at that peak. And as I mentioned, we can't use the 0.2% offset method for finding yield strength because of the viscoelastic effect of polymers. So instead, we define it as the point of necking. So let's take a, a closer look at necking and understand exactly what's happening. So necking, as we said earlier, occurs at a maxima in the force displacement or stress strain curve. Therefore, at necking, we can say that the change in force with respect to the change in strain is equal to zero. Now, keep in mind here that we're not using stress in this equation, which would make more sense maybe intuitively, but the reason we don't use stress is because the assumption behind stress is that there's a cr constant cross-sectional area, and we can't make that assumption once necking occurs, so we have to use the force instead of stress. But nonetheless, less, we assume that the change in force with respect to strain is equal to zero at this yield point where the necking occurs. We also assume that volume is conserved in the sample. The cross-sectional area is not constant, but the volume is constant. So that means we can then say that the area times the length at any given time is equal to the initial area times the initial length, or the volume is equal to the original volume. We then can convert that equation into a ratio of A0 over A, which equals L over L0. So just keep that equation in the back of your mind, and we'll see how we'll use it again later. Now we want to insert this equation into the equation for true strain. And if you don't recall, the equation for true strain is this true strain equals the natural log of the instantaneous length divided by the original length. So I replace that portion of the equation with A0 over A. 
Then I take the derivative of that equation and find that the change in strain with respect to the change in area is equal to minus 1 over a, which is the derivative of the natural log of a naught over a. Now returning back to our equation for the minima df over d epsilon equals 0, we can replace df with sigma times the instantaneous cross-sectional area, which would be the true for true strain. Whoops, excuse me. So that means d sigma a over d epsilon is equal to a d sigma d epsilon, if I take the partial derivative, plus sigma d a over d epsilon equals a d sigma d epsilon plus sigma times negative a, which is the inverse of the previous equation. So let me go back one slide. So if I take d, sig d epsilon dA, that's equal to minus 1 over a. So here I'm replacing dA d epsilon with minus a. And that's all equal to 0. So I can now solve this equation for d sigma d epsilon is equal to sigma. What this means is that necking occurs when the work hardening or strain hardening rate of the material, the change in stress with respect to the change in strain, is equal to the applied stress. That's when necking occurs. This is true both in metals and polymers. Now keep in mind that the yield strength of the point at which necking will occur is highly dependent on the strain rate of the, of the load that you're applying to the material. So if you apply a very slow rate of strain, you get a low yield stress, and if you apply a high rate of strain, you get a high yield stress. So what this means is that the yield strength as a function of strain rate is equal to a straight line equation when we take the log of the strain rate. In order to solve this equation, we'd have to be given the material parameters A and B in order to do the solving. Lastly, let's take a closer look at thermal softening. If we actually measure the temperature of a sample along its length, we'll notice that the temperature remains close to room temperature until you approach the neck region and then the temperature increases dramatically to as high as 65 degrees Celsius. That's a pretty high temperature for a polymer and it results in a large amount of viscoelastic deformation. And then the temperature drops dra dramatically